Now, chapter 5 through chapter 48 are going to review, in a sense, the allotment of the land of Israel, specifically who lives where. Also, there's going to be a few rules about how the land is occupied. Uh, if if uh, we're not going to read through all this, if you want to make a little note, because chapter 48, verses 1 through 29, give this allotment. Now, with that, I thought it'd be easier just to show you a picture than to read 29 verses. So this is what it looks like. And that is what's described in chapter 48. Uh, we're going to see a couple of things about that little square. Uh, and as we go back to chapter 45, and this is uh, what I believe is the millennial reign of Christ, and this is how the land is divided up. And we're going to find out some interesting things about this too. One thing specifically that I think if uh, our world today, uh, back in 1948 when Israel became a nation, if they would have followed or read some of these uh, verses, I think it would have saved a lot of headache, a lot of heartache for a lot of people. But we'll get to that soon. Chapter 45, verse 1. Moreover, when you divide the land in t by lot into inheritance, you shall set apart a district for the Lord, a holy section of the land, and its length shall be 25,000 cubits and one, a width of 10,000, and it shall be holy throughout its territory all around. So this time, which is not like before, there's a specific allotment for the Lord. Now, in most of your Bibles, if you see the word cubits after that first uh, 25,000, it's italicized, correct? Okay, so that means that that word was added by translators. Now, most scholars adhere to that being cubits because uh, that has been the rule of measurement since chapter 40. Remember, we got a cubit and a hand breadth, and then we've got a, a rod that is about 11 feet. What is a cubit? Just for, for um, review, the distance between your elbow and the top of your fingers. Now, we know that not everybody's arm is the same length, so there was a standard which was about 22 inches. Some differ between 18 and 24, so we're going to stick in the middle. Uh, then the hand breadth, which is this part of your hand, which is about four inches. Now, mine's probably not. I was sitting with Jesse today, and we were talking, and she said, you've got small hands. I said, yeah, I know. That's what I inherited from my dad. Uh, small hands and an eyebrow that goes straight across. Now, you don't see it because of my glasses and because when my wife and I got married, she made me pluck them all out because she said it looks stupid. But that's another story. And then we've got that rod that's described close to 11 feet or 3 meters. And so this area... Uh, is about seven miles in length and about two and three quarter miles width. And this section is for the Lord, and it's like a rectangle like that map we saw earlier. Verse two, of this, there shall be a square plot for the sanctuary, 500 by 500 rods with 50 cubits around it for open space. So this is the district that you shall measure. 25,000 cubits long, 10,000 wide, and it shall be uh, the sanctuary of the most holy place. So within this rectangle is the city and the temple or the capital city. And it's a mile, roughly a mile and a half square uh, with a, a tenth of a mile border all the way around it. Now verse 5 tells us that within this area, priests, the Levites, will live and serve the temple. Now I've got another map for you of just this square in there. So that is what it looks like. I'm going to turn around because I can't read it. So we have areas on each side that are going to be for the prince. We'll get to that in a moment. Area for the Levites is on the top. In the middle is the temple, and that's the area where uh, the priest of Zadok, remember those are the only guys that get to serve in the inner chamber, uh, those guys. And then there's city land on each side. Uh, the Bible describes one of them as a garden. And then the city right there in the middle. So You've got this plot of land here. Verse 5, the area 25,000 cubits long, 10,000 wide, shall belong to the Levites and minister to the temple, and they shall have 20 chambers as possessions. So how many of your Bibles say 20 chambers? Some say cities or uh, towns to live in. Towns to live in is probably the better translation. 
Uh, so this is where those Levites will live. Verse 6, you shall appoint as the property of the city 5,000 cubits wide and 25,000 long, so that little area right there adjacent to the district of the holy section, and it shall belong to the whole house of Israel. Now here's something interesting. Note specifically that God calls out this area that it belongs to the people. It does not belong to the king, does not belong to the prince, it doesn't belong to the political leaders, it belongs to the people. Verse 7, the prince shall have a section on one side and on the other of the holy uh, district and the city's property. And bordering on that holy district, the city's properties extended westward on the west side and eastward to the east side. And the length shall be side by side, one of the tribal portions from the west border to the east border, and the land shall be his possession in Israel. My princes shall no more oppress people, my people, but they shall give the rest of the land to the house of Israel according to their tribes. So now we've, again, we've concluded there's this one little area here. There's a section in the middle, top part for Levites. You've got an area around the temple that the prince, a priest of Zadok will live in, and then the city, and then the outside pieces, those belong to the prince. Now, we've concluded that this prince in our other studies is probably King David. Now, this prince will have a small allotment within this section. Let's put that map up again on those sides. Uh, and chapter 48 clarifies all these boundaries again for us, and I'm going to let you read that on, their own, on your own. So in this millennial reign, there's something that's going on here. God is correcting the protocol of worship. He's correcting the protocol of sacrifices and specifically how leadership deals with people. Now, there was a continued abuse, if you remember our studies through 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Samuel, uh, that the kings throughout is Israel uh, abused, in a sense, they always wanted land, right? And God never designed it that way. See, Samuel reminded the people, if you want to make a note, 1 Samuel chapter 8, when the people wanted a king, right? They didn't want to fought, they didn't want to live in a theocracy anymore. They wanted to live in a monarchy. They wanted a king to rule them because everybody else did. And Samson warned them. He said, listen, guys, if you get a king, here's what's going to happen. He's going to tax you. And he's going to take your sons to fight in war. And he's going to take your crops to feed uh, the people that serve him. And there's all these things that are going to happen. And they're like, we don't care. We want a king. And they got a king. And the kings abused every one of those things that Samson warned them of. Isaiah, Micah, Zephaniah all warned of God's coming judgment, specifically because kings and leadership abused the land. They took something that wasn't theirs. Do you remember that story of Ahab? And he had this guy that lived next to him, a vineyard, Naboth. And he said, hey, I want that land. And he goes, no, we can't do that, man. God's word says that this belongs to the family. And he goes, no, I'll buy it from you. I'll give you a fair price. And he wouldn't sell it to him. And so wonderful Ahab just throws a little pity party and his wife Jezebel goes out, sets this guy up, gets him killed, and takes his land. See, that, that kind of stuff's not happening anymore. The leaders of Israel were corrupt. That story's in 1 Kings 21, if you want to make a note. See, in the, in the millennial reign, that kind of stuff is not going to be tolerated. Remember, we have read, God will rule with a rod of iron. Verse 9. Thus says the Lord God, enough, O princes of Israel, remove violence and plundering, execute judgment and righteousness, justice and righteousness, and stop dispossessing my people. Says the Lord God, you shall have honest scales and honest ephah and an honest bath. Now, in all in all, the people of Israel, the people were treated horribly by the government people were, that were supposed to be representing God in judgment and righteousness became selfish and started plundering the people. Justice and righteousness were redefined by greed and dishonesty. Well, well that kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? 
If only we had politicians that loved the Lord and did what was right. So uh, another proof that when there is no righteous standard of living, the policies will continue to be moved and established by what the people want. See, democracy is weakened when decisions are made by what people want and not by what is right. Now listen carefully. The kingdom of God is not a democracy. The kingdom of God is a theocracy. God's word says it, and that's it. There's no discussion. Drop down to verse 15. And one lamb shall be given from a flock of 200, from the rich pastures of Israel, and it shall be for grain offerings, burnt offerings, and peace offerings to make atonement for them, says the Lord God. All the people of the land shall give this offering for the prince in Israel. So offerings will be given to this prince, who will then bring those offerings to the Lord. And this prince will actually represent the people, right? The prince is going to represent the people to the Lord, not oppress them before the Lord. Look at the end of verse 8. He says, and my princes shall no more oppress my people. Verse 17. Then it shall be that the prince's part to give burnt offerings, grain offerings, and drink offerings at the feast, the new moons and Sabbaths, and all the appointed seasons of the house of Israel. He shall prepare the sin offering, the grain offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offerings to make atonement for the house of Israel. Now throughout this future time for Israel, Ezekiel is clearly giving us a lot of detail. But if you've noticed so far, there's one position that he has never mentioned, a high priest. Here, the prince brings the sacrifices and offerings to the Lord, not a high priest. Interesting. Now, verses 18 through 20 will give the instruction on temple purification. Verses 21 through 25 give instruction about the Feast of Passover and Tabernacles and how they're to be observed. All of these, as we talked about the last few weeks, all of these commemorating God's faithfulness and his promises, and specifically his faithfulness to his promises. Go to chapter 46. We're going to talk about worship a bit. Thus says the Lord God, the gateway of the inner court that faces towards the east shall be shut the six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and on that day of the new moon it shall be opened. Now we're talking about the inner court, not the outer court east gate. Remember that one's, once, once the whole Spirit of God came in, that one was shut never to be opened again, giving us a great picture that once God's spirit is there, he's not leaving. So it's going to be closed for six days, but on the Sabbath day, the seventh day, it's time to worship. Verse 2, the prince shall enter by the way of the vestibule of the gateway from the outside and stand by the gatepost. The priest shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offering. He shall worship at the threshold of the gate. Then he shall go out but the gate shall not be shut until evening. Likewise, the people of the land shall worship at this entrance to the gateway before the Lord on the Sabbaths and the new moons. So the prince will lead this worship to the Lord as the priest will be working hard, preparing sacrifices when the people come to worship. Now, this kind of goes against the Sabbath rules, right? Because you've got these priests that are going to be preparing many, many sacrifices to be offered to the Lord on the Sabbath. See, all the people of the land will come and worship this. Now, I want you to highlight this. So uh, he says all the people here. Now, again, I told you we're going to talk about this a little later, but make a little note about all the people. So verses 4 through 8 will give specific instructions of how the priest offers these sacrifices, or the, uh, the prince, I'm sorry. Verse 9, 
But when the people of the land come before the Lord on the appointed feast days, whoever enters the way of the north gate to worship shall go out by the south gate. But whoever enters by the way of the south gate shall go out by the way of the north gate. He shall not return by the way of the gate through which he came in, but he shall go through the opposite gate. This is interesting here too. The prince shall be in their midst. When they go in, he shall go in. When they go out, he shall go out. Now what we see here is uh, just a flow of traffic, right? Now thankfully, there's not a, a meter space required to stand between people. Uh, that was a COVID joke. If you come in the north gate, you go out the south gate. If you come in the south gate, you go out the north, the north gate. Why? Well, because as if you don't know this already, worship should be done decently and in order. Worship is not a free-for-all. Worship is not open mic night. There's a reason that we do things the way we do them, because things should be done in order. Our God is a God of order. And this prince will be among the people. Now think about it. There's no green room back backstage for him to hide out in and wait till it's time for him to show up. He comes and goes just like everybody else does. Interesting, right? Now, it reminded me of a story. At, at my home church, Calvary Vero, uh, we were next door to a funeral home, and they had a small sanctuary, maybe held about 50 people. And any time uh, they had big services, uh, we would allow them to use our, our sanctuary. Uh, so when that happened, uh, part of my job was that room. And so I cleared the stage except for a podium. And depending on what kind of funeral it was, they would bring the casket in and, and put it in the front. But the stage was clear. So one time they had asked to use the facility and this guy uh, I, the family introduced me to their pastor, priest. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what he was. Uh, but uh, he said, he told me, he said, uh, the stage is clear and I need a chair. And I said, oh, okay, I'll get one. So I grabbed a chair and I set it up on the stage. And he came back and found me and was a bit stern. He said, uh, no, uh, I, I think you don't understand. Um, I need a chair that's more honoring. I was like, um, we don't have any honoring chairs. I got chairs just like the other 378 that are out there in the front, and, and that's it. I think it's interesting in this scenario that we get the prince, right? Not Jesus, but the prince who gets his own land and other things, but everything else, he functions just like everybody else does, especially in worship. See, we, you guys need to be very careful, and, and you are more than, uh, if you have the freedom to come and confront me if I ever get to think that I'm better than you or that I deserve more than you, then you better find another church to go to, and you better go talk to the leadership and get me fired, right? Because that is not what this position means, right? In the economy of God, the amazing thing about it is whether you're a teacher, a worship leader, a guy that sets up chairs, that mops the floor, that cleans the, to the toilets, all the pay's the same, right? We are doing things for the Lord and how we were called to be used by the Lord. So I think it's pretty awesome that he calls us out. So uh, verses 11 through 15 now give instruction to what those offerings look like. Let's pick up in verse 16. Thus says the Lord God, if the prince gives a gift of some of his inheritance to any of his sons, it shall belong to his sons. It is their possession by inheritance. But if he gives a gift of some of his inheritance to one of his servants, it shall be his until the year of liberty, after which it shall return to the prince. But his inheritance shall belong to his sons, and it shall become theirs. Now, again, here we can pretty much conclude, obviously, that this is not Jesus, because this guy's got sons. Uh, this prince has also been given an allotment of land, right? That's his. 
And in a sense, this inheritance, what they're talking about is the land. He can give some of that land to any of his kids. He can also give that land to someone else. But it must be returned to the prince at the year of liberty. Now, the Old Testament gives us clear instruction about how the Jewish nation should function with property, inheritance laws, and family claims. Now, this year of liberty, let's look at this for a moment. This is another word uh, that we probably are more familiar with, the year of jubilee. The year of jubilee was the instruction from the Lord, and it appears that the Jewish nation never really followed it. They celebrated it, but they really didn't act on it. If you want to make a note, Leviticus 25 and Leviticus 27 describe this. So in this celebration, they had instruction that was supposed to be carried out. Every 50 years, the nation was given this instruction, and it was pretty much to level out the economy, to keep poverty and social economics from being a burden to the nation. So here's the first thing that this, every 50 years was supposed to happen. You're going to love this one if you don't know this already. You ready? All debts are forgiven. Whoa. Number two, any land is returned that was traded or sold is returned to its original owner. Number three, slaves are freed. Now, slavery then was not what you and I probably would describe it as today. So here's what would happen then. If you got in debt, right, and you owed money and you couldn't pay it, then you would go work for that person until that debt was paid off. Sometimes, and this is where they stretched it a little bit, it would not only be the man, but he would also, well, hey, my wife's going to come work for you to pay this debt off. Oh, here's my kids. They're going to come over and work for you to pay this debt off. And depending on how much that debt was, it could be, quite a period of time. Now, Sunday we talked about bond servant and servant, right? So here's an interesting thing that would happen at the year of Jubilee. If someone became a servant, but they loved their master so much, it's like, I, I'm going to stay here. This is way better than living at my house, right? I get a great meal, get my clothes taken care of, yeah, there's all this stuff. And then the servant who would be freed would be allowed to become a bond servant. So here's what he would do. The servant would, they would open the, the front door and they would put his ear on the door, right? They take a nail and <laughs> poke it right in his ear and they put an earring in it. That's how you could define or see if someone was a bond servant or not. They ring. They say, listen, no, I have decided that I've committed my life to the master. Right? Pretty interesting, huh? So, uh, that uh, slaves were freed at this time as well. And then other, th another thing that would happen, because every seven years, so the seventh year, so the 49th year, uh, the land was supposed to rest. Now, we know that Israel never followed that one. Every seven years, the land was supposed to rest, and that's one of the reasons they were in captivity for 70 years, because there was 490 years that they did not obey the Lord. But on this 50th year of Jubilee, the land was supposed to rest for two years. So the 49th year and the 50th year. We often struggle with trusting the Lord, right? I mean, there's different situations in life, and sometimes we, I think we're really good at some areas, and sometimes we're not, yet we often focus on just the areas that we blow it in, and the, the enemy just comes in and has a heyday with us. But I want you to think about the year of Jubilee. I think this brings a whole new level of trust and dependence upon the Lord. So... Let's say you're the guy that people owe money to and you forgive those debts. Hmm. 
know, we're not talking five bucks here, three dollars. You know, no, we're talking probably some good, uh, substantial amounts of money. What if the person that owes you money is now become your servant, and they haven't paid off their debt, and then they get set free. They get to go back home. What about land you've acquired? And you're getting income from that land. And you got to give it back. This is the tough one. How about this one? The land rests for two years. No plowing, no harvesting, no bringing in the sheaves. You're just dependent on either what you've stored or i.e. dependent upon the Lord. See, now I, th I, th I think when we think about it that way, ah, that, I don't know if that sounds so great. <laughs> Right? If we're all in debt up to our ears, that sounds really awesome. <laughs> but if, you know, if, you, if you're the person that's the giver, there's a whole new level of trust. There's a whole new level of dedication and dependence upon the Lord that for two years you're going to have to walk through. Verse 18. Moreover, the prince shall not take any of the people's inheritance by evicting them from their property. He shall provide an inheritance for his sons from his own property so that none of my people may be scattered from his property. So again, another affirmation that this prince will be just, nothing like the kings of Israel from the past. Verses 19 and through 24, they all describe the way offering is to be prepared. And then there's this little kitchen area and it tells how things are to be done and specific area for just doing uh, preparing sacrifices. Let's go to chapter 20, 47. We're doing it. I told you we'd make it. Verse 1. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar, and then he brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around to the outside of the outer gateway that faces east. And there was water running out of the right side. So now Ezekiel is brought to a pipe breaking problem. There's a water leak somewhere in the temple. What is he supposed to do? It's running out of the bottom of the temple, south of the, of the altar, and it's going out. The guy takes him around up to the north gate, out to the east side where it's walled shut, and there's water coming out. Now, I, th I have to correct myself because I think a couple of weeks ago I told you that this, this uh, tape measure guy, that he wasn't mentioned anymore, this is probably him. You'll see why uh, when we get here. Verse 3. And when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, tape measure guy, he measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my ankles. So this is about a third of a mile. He's walking out away from the temple, and he's up to his ankles in water. Verse 4, again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my knees. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the water, and it came up to my waist. Now, again, so he's gone... About a mile now, a third each way, and uh, he's in waist-high water. Now, I don't know if there's any place like this here, so I'm going to, uh, on the other side of Florida, we have what's called the Gulf of Mexico, right? The water's really warm there. All the hurricanes go through there and gain strength and hit the land somewhere. But that water, when you walk out, it's a very slow uh, grade down. So you can walk out about 100 yards and be up to your ankles. You go out about another 100 yards and maybe you're up to your knees. And it, it, there's certain areas that are just like that. Now, the really gross thing about the Gulf of Mexico is that the water is like you've ran a really warm bath. You know, it's, it's not like refreshing, cool. It's just like bath water, right? And they're not, never mind. You know, people take their families to the beach and uh, kids don't use the toilet. But anyway, uh, 
Verse 5. <laughs> Got that in your mind for the rest of the evening, don't you? Come back to the Bible study. Again, he measured a thousand, and it was a river, and I could not cross. And the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. Now, yeah, he, he's in. It's time to swim. He can't touch the bottom. And uh, we don't know if his eagle can swim. We don't know if there's sharks in the water. But I know that my wife, when she gets out in water, when she can't touch the bottom, she wants to get out of the water. She either has to touch the bottom or see what's going on. She doesn't like to go out deep. You know why, right? Because my wife's afraid of sharks. Verse 6. And he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. Now, what does this all mean? Now, sadly, there are all kinds of interpretations that you can read about this text right here. And I just, listen, it's completely conjecture. He doesn't tell us. Now, I think there's people that spiritualize this text in some ways that could be good and there could be something that's pulled out of it. Some of those are interesting, but good Bible study, we need to do something. We need to stick to the text. What does the text say and what do we observe from the text? Here's what we have so far. We have a trickle of water that's coming out of the temple that's gone under the wall and now it's turned into this big, mighty river that's too deep that he, and he has to swim in it, right? That's what we have. Verse 7. When I returned there along the bank of the river, there were many trees on one side and the other. Then he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley, and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, the waters are healed. And it shall be that the very living thing that moves wherever the rivers go will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. So what's our ob observation here? We've got a flow of water that's deep and it brings life and healing. Now, you guys know that there's a sea out there in Israel today, and it's called the Dead Sea. And nothing lives in it because the salt content is too high. Right? Uh, again, we're just putting two and two together. But let, let me give you some possible application. Now, do you remember our study in uh, John chapter 4 with the woman at the well? Do you remember what Jesus said to her? Look at this. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, asked him, and he would have given you living water. We'll get to chapter 7 here in a couple of weeks. Verse 38 says, And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, how do we know that this is applicable to us today? Those are good verses, right? And we can kind of manipulate some of it to make some sense. But look at John, the next verse after this. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus has not yet been glorified. Hmm. See, because Jesus now has died, he has been resurrected, and he is glorified sitting at the right hand of the Father. With that, you and I can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You and I can have a healing of the heart and mind. And you and I today can experience life and life more abundantly. That's pretty amazing. But sadly, most Christians today do not depend on this resource for life. 
Things for the believer have gone from one extreme to another. Either being super, super weird, (laughs) right? Or an Eeyore Christian. And there should be some balance in the middle, right? You know, in, in our Philippians reading a few days ago, chapter 4, he said, yeah, here's what I know. Through all the things that have happened to me in life, I've learned to be content. Right? He says, listen, I don't let the peripherals of life dictate who God says I am. He says, whether I got money or I'm broke, whether I got a roof over my head or I'm sleeping outside, whether my stomach is full or I'm hungry, I've learned that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, here we see these healing waters that restore the ecological system, the nature of God, how nature, how God originally designed it. You knew God cared about the environment, right? Now, it's crazy that our world today is more concerned about the creation than the creator. Fish will thrive in the water. He talks about salt marshes that will maintain, uh, that'll stay salt marshes and maintain that ecosystem. Let's go to verse 12. Along the bank of the river, by this side and that, will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither. Their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary and their fruit will be food and their leaves will be for medicine. So life along these riverbanks will bring fruit every month, right? How cool would that be? Fruit for food and leaves with a medicinal value. Verse 13, For thus says the Lord God, these are the borders by which you shall divide the land and the inheritance among the 12 tribes, and Joseph shall have two portions. So now we know that there's 12 tribes, right? So Joseph gets two, right? Because of Manasseh and Ephraim, his sons. They get an allotment of their own. Verse 21, thus you shall divide this land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. Verse 22, it shall be that you will divide it by lot as an inheritance for yourselves and for the strangers who dwell among you and who bear children among you. Hmm. They shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And it shall be that whatever tribes... Uh, Whatever tribe the stranger dwells, there you shall give him his inheritance, says the Lord God. Now, again, I'm not going to expound on this a lot, but what if uh, these verses had been considered in 1948? (laughs) What if these verses were considered today with all the crazy nonsense that's going on in that country? He says strangers, not just Jews, will have an inheritance in the land. But who says that? Look at the end of verse 23. Who says that? The Lord God. (laughs) How many of you know that when you argue with God, you usually lose? Anybody learn that lesson yet? Verse 30. These are the exits of the city. We're talking about the city now. On the north side, measuring 4,500 cubits, uh, the gates of the city shall be named after the tribes of Israel, three gates on the north, uh, for the gate of Reuben, Judah, and Levi, uh, east gate, uh, 4,500 cubits, three gates for Joseph, Benjamin, and Dan, uh, south side, measuring 4,500 cubits, three gates for Simeon, for Issachar, and Zebulon, and 4,500 cubits for the three gates for Gad, Asher, and the gate of Naphtali. All the way around shall be 18,000 cubits. And the name of the city from that day shall be, the Lord is there. Now Hebrew, that is Yahweh Shema. 
Now, this city is way different than the New Jerusalem that is described in Revelation chapter 20 that we studied a few months ago. Now, if you want to do some homework, we're not going to go over those difference, all of those differences tonight, but I'd, I'd encourage you to pull out your Bible and compare the two. There's some, a lot of similarities, and there's a few things that are way different, and I want to specifically bring out one thing that is different. See, the New Jerusalem, right, is, is this large cube, right? And here's the measurements of that cube it is, if it is over the Middle East. So that is the New Jerusalem is coming down from heaven. That's huge. It will have three gates on each side, just like Ezekiel's, and all of the 12 tribes of Israel will be named. But Revelation chapter 21, verse 14 says this. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. See, this is something that Ezekiel's temple doesn't have. See, the church is involved in the new one. The church really isn't involved in this one. Now, how that works? Interesting question. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Let me show you why this is super, super important and why the church is involved in this new heaven, new earth, new city of Jerusalem. Chapter 2, pick up in verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple of the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of the God of God in the spirit. That is incredible, right? Now, I hopefully, as you've gone through this book, uh, depending on where you stand, you can see how there, there can be some confusion in Israel, in the church today, and, and there's there are people that have many different views on that. And uh, I'm not going to argue or debate those. I've shared with you guys where I stand. I believe that God is not done with Israel. I think... Uh, I, I'm certain that Romans 11, 12, and 13 all deal with that. Uh, so that is not a problem. But at this time, our church age, God is not dealing with J the Jews. He's going to deal with them in the tribulation period. Right now, he's dealing with you and I and anybody that will come to him. And how we fit in in that new, that uh, thousand-year reign, I don't know, maybe we're just people that live among them. And we get to be a part. You know, I, I was kind of hoping I might have some Hawaii property. Uh, but, you know, who knows where we'll be. But we do know that people are going to be coming from all over to worship at this temple in this thousand-year reign. But in the new Jerusalem, with the new heaven and new earth, we're plugged in. We're a part. And now there's a picture of how you and I should live today. Remember how we talked about the temple a few weeks ago? and how there was no court of the Gentiles in Ezekiel's temple. See, there, there's not that separation anymore. But yet there is a specific area of a place that's, and the, and the difference is it's called holy. Right? It's not called you're a Jew or where, what you have or don't have. See, the call for you and I, and I think the application is super, super clear. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I, have the opportunity to choose to be holy. Now, do we do it right all the time? No, right? We can all raise our hands. But God is gracious, he's loving, he's kind, and he's on our side. He wants to see us succeed. But in that, there's things that you and I have got to decide we want to be holy, right? Holy means set apart. There's certain places that the believer shouldn't go anymore. There's certain places or certain things that a believer shouldn't do anymore. 
There's certain things that shouldn't come out of a believer's mouth, right? There may be friends that, listen, we can have friends, but do I hang out with some people like I do other? No, because I know that they are going to bring, take me away from the Lord and not help me be set apart, right? Okay, so let's, let, let's pull all this back. Let's look at this book, Ezekiel, here real quick. We're gonna, we, I got a paragraph of going through this entire book. Ezekiel was a priest that never got to serve in the temple and was called by God to be a prophet 10 years after being in exile. And he was to give a prophetic word to the people. We saw him give warnings of God's judgment. We saw God's destruction of the nation that he warned them about. God also judged the surrounding nations for how they treated Israel. Then there was hope. All of these people that have been in exile, their temples destroyed, their land is taken from them, their city is wiped out, and he offers hope. Remember chapter 37. Can these bones live? Like, no, there's no way. And then God gives him a vision of that nation being restored. So their nation's restored. Ezekiel gives them a vision of that. Their temple is rebuilt, and the functionality of the nation will become fully complete, compiling to God's instruction without any corruption. That's hope. Right? See, that, that's what you and I look forward to in heaven, right? We're tired of going out there and things not working like they should, you know? So, you know, we, we, can, we can look really big at politics. We can look really big at our nation and how things we wish they would change. And that there's some people that are in there fighting for those changes. And we should pray for those people. But in a sense, we look at it and go, there's no hope. But we do have hope. Because there's one thing that God promised for right now. Jesus told the disciples, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. See, don't be Eeyore, and don't be super weird. Stand on God's word, because he wants to use you to do a work in your life, and he wants to change you. Who knows who you all might be able to talk to or, or influence, right? Who's your sphere of influence? Are we, are we influencing that sphere for Jesus? Are we letting that other things outside come in and influence us? Oh.